Would you like to know the secrets to funding your own music career as an independent artist? Well, in today's video, I'm going to be giving you the five strategies that you need to understand in order to get paid as an independent artist without the use of the music industry. Because I have a video, by the way, that talks about the difference between the industry and the business. Go watch that after this one if you don't know that difference already. But the main thing that we need to dive into first is that there's a misconception about labels, right? There's still this myth that's very pervasive around the music business that labels are going to do everything for you, right? So the best thing that you could do is get signed up with a label because if you started to dive into entrepreneurship education, hopefully with this channel, you guys have started that journey. If not, welcome to the journey. Um, but what's happening is we study opportunity cost and opportunity cost is something that's extremely beneficial for your mindset and decision making because you look at something and you say, what is the opportunity cost of doing this or not doing this? And you can look at something like a label and it's easy to fall into the trap of, well, my time is very valuable. It's obvious that I should delegate parts of my music business, both of which are true. Then some people come to the faulty conclusion that therefore they should get hooked up with the record label because the record label will take all the business stuff off their plate and they can just focus on making art. That's where everything starts to fall apart. And that's where the devil is in the details because labels would often like to present things like that to you, but that's not often how it goes. I've worked with two independent labels so far. One I could say was a good one and one was a bad one, but in either case, the model in the business is broken and it's not affordable or profitable for artists to do that because what we need to understand is that the opportunity cost is actually a little bit more nuanced because the opportunity cost for getting signed up with a label is this if I get signed up with a label sure I may have potential to get more success I might also get shelved but let's just be positive I might get my music out there but you will not own a majority of that music you'll own effectively less than 10% of it, right? Think about this. Snoop Dogg gets a billion streams. Now, he should be getting about $5 million roughly from that. Because he has so many people, so many hands in the Snoop Dogg pocket, because he's got the, the industry around him that are running his business, he only makes 40 grand from a billion streams. I want you to think about that for a second. That means you could have the best case scenario happen to you, like a Snoop Dogg, where you just absolutely blow up your cultural icon and people are always streaming your music. And if you do that, the opportunity cost is, yeah, I have the fame now, but I have none of the financial security that you should have for someone at that level, right? Now, some people will say, well, I'll leverage it into other things. And to me, that just shows that the music wasn't the main priority to begin with. You know what I'm saying? Because people are then focused on fame and money as opposed to being an artist and creating art that actually impacts people, which is what I believe in. And so I believe that the opportunity cost is greater to work with a label than to work without it. Because if you work with them, let's say best case scenario, you blow up, you will own less than 10% of that business. As opposed to you have to put in a little bit more, you know, sweat equity, some more elbow grease, and build your own business as an independent, but you actually keep 100% of the profits or close to it, more like 80 to 70% once you start hiring people. And that's really beneficial because you don't have to have a billion streams to make $40,000 as an independent. I, I, don't, I can't do the math off the top of my head that quickly, but it's nowhere near a billion streams. I think it's $4,000 for a million, so extrapolate that 10 million you get 10 million streams as opposed to a billion streams and you make the same money as a major label artist. I would rather be the independent artist who, yeah, is smaller, less known, but guess what? This is something people don't talk about. Sometimes you don't want to be super famous. I know that sounds crazy because a lot of us have this idea in our head that we want to be as popular as possible, and I get that. But there is a certain threshold that once you cross it, the fame becomes uncomfortable. You get more money and more attention, but the downside is you get more attention. <laughs> and uh, then you can't go out in public anymore. And that's, people don't talk about that, but that's beside the point. The whole thing is, I'm going to go off on a tangent if I keep going down that rabbit hole, but the idea is that there's a myth going around that the label is going to do everything for you and you're better off because you want to be a smart business person, you got to delegate, right? So why, why don't I just de delegate this to the label? 
Well, because you'll have no business left over and they will effectively own it or you'll just get shelved and they still own everything. You know, I, I've told this story before where the label pitched to me one time that it was a 50-50 split. You know, we'll take 100% of the masters, you take 100% of the songwriting credits. That's 50-50, sound fair? I'm like, yeah, that does sound fair. And then later on I did research and found out that master royalties pay out six to one. Yeah, yeah, six times more money gets paid out to master royalties than to songwriter royalties. So yeah, it was 50-50 on paper, but when it came to our pockets and our wallets, we actually gave away 85% of the business. And that's a small indie label. You don't think those big record labels, if they got advantage over you and have leverage over you, they're not going to do something even worse? Come on now. Let's be, let's be real here. This business, we all know the nature of this business, hopefully. So hopefully we understand here that we have a pathway forward that does have a little bit more work involved. You have to get self-educated, okay? But put it this way. You learned how to play your instrument. You learned how to sing. You learned how to write songs. You learned how to play. You can learn how this business works. I promise you that. Because if there's people who were C and D students who can start Fortune 500 companies that don't go to college and all this stuff, we don't even have to have that big of results to understand that you don't have to be Einstein to do this, okay? You just have to learn the particular strategies and frameworks. Once you learn those and start practicing and get good at, getting good at them, you're set, you know? So, and here's another thing. I'm not saying that you should never delegate, okay? Before I move on to the next point, I don't want people to say, uh, take away from this video, oh my gosh, so Dak says never delegate anything. That's not what I want to suggest to you. There are certain things that I think are worth delegating. So for instance, I think it's easy to learn how to do Facebook meta ads. Once you know what to do and get someone to just show you how to do it, it's actually very easy. You know, it's, it's really not difficult. And people like to make it like this big thing in their head, but when they actually figure out how to do it, it's not that big of a deal. So I guarantee there are things in your business right now that you thought that's a lot of work. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to figure that out. I should just delegate it when it's really not that hard to figure out. I mean, I probably it took me a weekend to figure out how to do uh, Spotify ads that ran to a pixel and uh, you can track the conversions and it runs to a playlist so you get more streams per Like that whole thing, I figured that out in a weekend. You can do that. Like I, I guarantee if you just dedicate a weekend to figuring it out, you will figure it out. And if you work with someone like me or any kind of ad coach like Andrew Southworth, he's a really great Spotify ads coach. Um, if you work with people like him, he'll break it down for you or I'll break it down for you. It's very, very simple, but you got to get educated. And that's sort of the dilemma that a lot of new artists faced is like, oh my man, should I like pursue this label or should I dedicate, you know, time to just learning it myself? And there is a, there's a play here because people just think labels are the cure-all and that's not the right way of looking at it. The way I've always looked at it and it's gotten me success in my music business and other aspects of my life too. Um, like whether, you know, some of y'all know that I've done real estate investing in my early twenties and things like that. Um, so like the whole idea is you don't look at the label to solve all the problems for you. You look for people who are doing it and can educate you and then you get their knowledge so you can do it yourself. It's the whole purpose of like why books exist or why courses exist or why coaching exists. Find the person who has the knowledge you want and need for your business. Figure out from them what you need to learn to actually implement it and get it done. So like I mentioned, there's tons of people like in the music business education space that have a lot of different skills and whatever your skill set is, I guarantee you can find somebody who's a perfect match for you. Like for me, I'm the offer guy. I'm the guy that's all about like selling offers and creating storytelling and persuasion. That's like my super specialty. Um, some would call my superpower. But other people, like I mentioned er earlier, um, I think it's Geneva Studios is Andrew's company, but Andrew Southworth or uh, Geneva Studios, that's like Spotify, Facebook ad masterclass zone, right? I also think there's Smart Music Business who has uh, some, some great Spotify stuff if you're trying to learn how to you know, drive ads that way. So all I'm trying to get at here is that there's plenty of resources out there that you can spend like $100, $200, and now you've got education that will serve you for a lifetime. So the opportunity cost. I spend $200 to $500 learning the skills I need to operate my music business. Heck, let's even just say you spent five grand 
I know, right? Some of y'all are like, I can't imagine spending five grand, but let's just say theoretically, you spent five grand on education for your music business. I think that five grand will return more of an ROI faster. By the way, for those of you that don't know, ROI means return on investment. You'll get a better return on investment from that $5,000 in self-education than you'll ever get throwing $5,000 at a label. In fact, to even get signed up with one of the labels I worked with, it was like an $8,000 program that they had, that they were setting us up with. So, and those $8,000 <laughs> generated us maybe $250, $500 worth of income over multiple years of working with the label and having the royalties be distributed that way. So uh, the ROI is not looking very good there. Even if I got more streams, I saw less money. It's crazy, right? But if you look at the education that I've invested in and the return investment I've got on that education, it's so much bigger than the, because put it this way, there has been no ROI that I've ever gotten from a label. There's never, let me say this really clearly for everyone so they really understand this. I've worked with two different labels now. And in either scenario, there was no way that an ROI was even feasible. It was so beyond measure. Like we would have needed millions of streams to pay back what we spent with these labels. It's, it's ridiculous. Okay. So self-education, the next step, I've, I'm going to move on to the next thing. So hopefully everyone understands. The second thing is revenue streams, revenue streams, like creating offers around your merchandise, your fan clubs, your shows, live streams. There's so many different ways that you can create revenue streams, but here's what I would actually do for you in this video that I think will be more helpful than me just saying what I just said, right? Oh, you can do merch. You can do this. A lot of y'all know that already. <laughs> you know that you can go sell merchandise. You can go sell a Patreon. You can go do those things. But what I would recommend to you is get less focused on all the different products you have to create and sell. And I would think about some core offers. Now, what is an offer? How does that differ from just a normal product? Is there anything different? Like, what's the deal? Think of it this way. A product is the thing, okay? An offer is the thing plus more value added to it. So how can you increase value? There's many ways to increase value, but one of the easiest ways is to bundle things. I like to bundle things where it's free for me to fulfill it. So let's say you sell a shirt here. It's like you're, maybe you have a core product offer that's a t-shirt that has a design that every single one of your fans needs to have, right? You can sell just that, or you could sell that with maybe a coffee mug that comes with it, and there's some videos um, of performances of you, and then there's a free download of a single that isn't even released yet. Which of these two sounds more attractive? Well, obviously the one with the extra stuff. And I can even take it a step further. Like it's all about the perception of value. So if I said, hey guys, I would sell you my phone uh, for $10,000. People are like, dude, it's an iPhone. Why would I pay 10 grand for an iPhone? And I'm like, I understand. If you just look at the product of the iPhone, you would say, Dax, there's no way you could charge 10 grand for an iPhone. But then I say, okay, well, let me explain. It's actually not just the phone. It's what's on the phone. So did you know that over the years that I've developed lots of relationships with different people in the industry? So for example, I have the phone number for the guitar player for the band, Nothing More, Grammy nominated band. Um, I've got the email and contact information uh, for different people like Clint Lowry from Seven Dust, Robert Sarzo. Um, I have contacts of different tour managers across the country who have access to multiple bands because they've toured with Nothing More, Motionless and White and others. Um, I have not only all these contact information, uh, all this contact information from all the people that I've met throughout the years, whether it's managers, uh, TMs, merch people, band members. I also have courses that I've downloaded into my phone. So every course I've ever bought, I've figured out a way to create an audio version of it and put it onto my phone so that when I'm in my car, I can just listen to these trainings that I've paid for, right? And it's like having a university on wheels. So not only if you buy my phone are you gonna get the phone and all the normal stuff you get with an iPhone, 
but you'll also get all my contacts to all the different people who I have who I've networked with in the music industry who could potentially provide you with an opportunity that could change your music career. And then I also have all the courses, so all the knowledge that I've invested, it's well into the five figures at this point, that I've invested into education has been put into this phone that you could access now just for buying my phone. And then on top of that, I also have unreleased tracks from my different friends across the, um, you know, the music industry who have sent me tracks like, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? So I've seen material that nobody else has seen. Now let me ask you a question. Has the value of the phone increased? It's still a phone. It's still the same old iPhone. The only difference though is there's something a little bit more value about this iPhone. You're not just getting a blank wiped iPhone that you can now use. You're getting the iPhone with all the contact, all that stuff. Now that's a story, a little thing that I, an example that I can show you to demonstrate the difference between an offer and a product. A product would just be like, here's my iPhone. An offer is, here's my iPhone and here's all the amazing stuff that I've put onto this iPhone that you can't literally get anywhere else but right here in this iPhone. Now we have an offer. Now we have something people are willing to pay a little bit more for because they're getting more and the perceived value of it is higher, okay? Products, a lot of times, are just races to the bottom. So someone sells a t-shirt for $30, and then some band goes, well, I wanna sell more than that person, so I'm gonna sell it for $25. And then the other band who can, who's just starting out, they're like, well, we wanna sell more. We're new on the scene, we wanna sell more t-shirts. We'll sell them for $20. How do you like that? And then now people are pissed off because they're like, well, I'll sell it for 15 and then just, you know, it's a race to the bottom until businesses either go out of businesses or they find the point where like no one can go below this because literally no one's making any money on it anymore. <laughs> As with an offer, you can set the price based on the perceived value. I'm telling you, when I say you can set the price, I mean you can set the price, right? Now, here's the thing. If you just put a really high number you're gonna to have to really justify that high number as to why the value is so high that that number that you're asking is actually low in comparison to the value. But if you just charge what you feel is pretty like normal, let's say you take the average cost people pay for that and you add like 15, 20% on top of it, now you've got yourself in a position where you've seen what the average is, but now you can price a little bit higher and create an offer around that. And you can also factor in the cost to fulfill. Like in that other example, I said a t-shirt and a mug. So you have to worry about shipping costs and that sort of stuff. Um, so you factor in those kind of things and figure out the price point that you set so that you can have a comfortable profit margin and you have a sales message around whatever it is you're selling, whether it's like your fan club or your VIP experience to your shows. Um, and by the way, you can do that as a small band. I, I know some people are probably thinking like, what? It's like, yeah, you even as a small independent band can have VIPs for your shows. But you're like, but what if I only attract like 10 to 15 people on my own? Well, then get some other people on the bill with you who can draw more people. Because that's, I'll tell you right now, our headlining shows have three to four bands on. Oh, I'm sorry, including us, right? So it's, we'll have two openers underneath us or three openers underneath us because we want to get as many people in that room as possible. So we pick the bands that we know can draw a crowd. So that's kind of the whole mindset. And when you do that, you're not relying on any kind of external thing of yourself. Like I'm going to have to sell all these tickets to justify the VIP tickets. Um, the only people that showed up are the VIPs. You know, you're not going to have a situation like that. You'll have a situation where a bunch of people show up and then some people paid for your VIP experience. Let me tell you this. We're not Beyonce by any stretch of the imagination, but the first time we offered a seven, what was it, a $60 uh, VIP, we had seven people buy it. Think of that. We literally had seven people take up a $60 upsell. We're, like I said, we're not a huge band. You know, we're not swimming in millions of monthly listeners but we're able to push that revenue stream higher and higher with the fan base that we do have because we're willing to make offers. But here's the thing too, we actually give people value in exchange for that, you know? Our VIP experiences come with pretty much everything you'd get from a normal VIP experience from a big band. We just facilitate it at a smaller scale for a smaller price.
right? Instead of going doing this in the theater, you're doing this in the in the ballroom or the dive bar, right? So that's the whole process of it. You know, you're creating offers. Now, obviously on top of that, you can have your royalties. Royalties are a great little cushion of, uh, of income that you can get over time. When people come to try and fund their own music business, focusing on streams is just, is not good. Don't do that. It's not going to lead to the results that you want, at least for a very, very long time. Uh, you can drive ads and stuff and try to do that, but again, it's very expensive. It takes a long time for the money to ROI. And then, you know, Spotify monthly listeners are very volatile, meaning they're going up and down, up and down all the time. I've seen artists that are big that'll go up to like 2 million monthly listeners. And then on a bad month, it goes down to 990,000. Right? Like you think it would be pretty consistent all the time, but it's like, no, there is some churn, you know, that happens for a myriad of different factors. But you have to be concerned about that if you're going to just think streamings are going to solve everything. I even had an artist one time who was talking to me who was, he didn't want to say it this way because I could tell he was kind of embarrassed to say it this way. And I wasn't trying to say anything negative to him or anything, but he was fundamentally asking, if I got a million views on YouTube, do I get paid every month for that million or do I just get paid one time for that million? And I guess that is a misconception out there that for some reason, like, oh, if I get to like, if my YouTube gets to 10 million views, then I'm going to be making money every month from the 10 million. I was like, no, 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 no. Put it this way. If you had one month that you made a million views in a video and you'll make the royalty payout for that, right? Let's say the next month you only got one view. You will only be paid for that one additional view. You won't be paid a million and one and your royalties will be paid for one. And so there is a misconception that streams are somehow going to create this recurring revenue for one time events. And like, we need to dispel all these myths and make sure we have a clear perspective that streaming is supposed to be supplemental, in my opinion. It's supposed to add on to your existing base of income. But the majority of the base of your income is coming from offers. That's by the way, an offer can be free. So if you need to collect somebody's email or something or their phone number because you want to join their you want them to join your email list or your text list, you can have offers that are free for you to fulfill, but it's free for them to get as well. Right? So it's free free. The only thing is I get your email, you get the cool thing. So there's those kind of offers and then there's also your core product offers, the things that you think every single fan should have or else it'll create FOMO. That type of thing. I've seen, uh, I've been talking with clients about creating um, different merchandise items that are things that they are known for, you know? So you could have one, I did, did one a while ago where uh, I had a client who wore a fedora that was part of his brand, right? So it's like, dude, we should sell fedoras. And now what you have is people who wear the fedora, they'll be out in the audience and they'll be like, why is everyone in fedoras? And then you'll see at the merch table that you're selling fedoras and like, oh, it's like part of the thing. like. I don't want to miss out on that. I want to be a part of the, the thing. I'm going to go get a fedora because I like this band and I want to be a part of the thing. So you can create core product offers that have that sort of FOMO element to them. I think those are the best core product offers, honestly. Um, they just sell and convert the best. But what you want to look at is how do I create offers, right? Not just sell my products on my print by demand merch store. I hate to be like this, but that's kind of lazy, y'all. Like just throwing merch up in a merch store and expecting people to go check it out and buy stuff all the time. That's not realistic. You'll get sales like that, but it's very, very trickled. Maybe one sale a month, two sales a month max when you're doing that kind of strategy. But if you're constantly integrating offers into the things that you're selling, so when you in like, let's say you get people to join your list, right? And that's sort of the third step we need to talk about, which is fan support. Right, so let's say we need to create engaging content that gets people into our world, they'll start following us, but don't put too much credence into followers, right? Because that's not the metric that matters. You're trying to get followers, but not because followers are the end, right? They're a means to the end of driving people into a list, like a text list or an email list. Now, from that perspective, you have a way that you can communicate with your audience because it's all about communication. When you're creating your content, hopefully you have some sort of idea 
as to who you're trying to get your music out to. And so you create messages that they can resonate with, right? So they hear the message and they really resonate with it. So like, I'm trying to think of a quick example off the top of my head. You have fans of 80s music. They love that 80s nostalgic sound. Make a piece of content that has a message, a headline on it, that talks about something about the 80s. You know, a real, one, uh, real popular one I've seen is, you know, you're in the 80s and you're a detective in Chicago and you can't seem to crack this case. And it's some kind of smooth 80s jazz in the background, right? You're trying to figure out how to put the message in front of the people who already like what you create so that they'll be like, oh, that's a thing that I already like. And you attract those fans in to the top level of the funnel through your content, right? And then from there, we start telling them stories in the email list, right? Because like I mentioned earlier, you're taking them from content level, follower level, and then you drive them and then you say something like, hey, I'll give you this for free in exchange for your email address. So when you do that, now they're in your email list and you can start telling them stories about you as an artist. So the first things I like to do is obviously give them the thing that you told them you were gonna give them. So send them an email or two about that. But then you start to go into the story. You start telling about who you are in a way that starts to build a bond. You're trying to create a connection between you and your fans so that they can go from just someone who's streaming to someone who's supporting you, okay? So you wanna figure out this method of how you're gonna create your story so that you build that connection, you build that bond. And that's what's gonna help you sell more. I guarantee it. A lot of people think that the, the way to sell people is to just ninja the heck out of somebody and just say these specific magic words in the right magic order and then people will just be like robots and go, yes, I will buy it, thank you. That's not how human beings work or behave. It's all about, when I say, when people think of magic words, what they really mean is I finally figured out the messaging that resonates. And so now the words appear magic because I just found the thing that resonates. But there are no like template magic words that you just say and all of a sudden people will just buy, right? That's not a thing. I mean, there, th that does exist, but whether it's effective or not is a different question. I am a whole heart believer in just like trying to create connection through stories, right? Selling through stories because you're telling them who you are and you're positioning yourself and selling, we call this pre-framing. You're pre-framing yourself so that instead of them being like, oh great, here's another artist trying to get me to buy their t-shirt that I don't really know that well. I mean, I saw them on social media and I joined the email list because I wanted to hear this thing, but now they're trying to just sell me stuff in every email. Nobody likes that experience. But if they join your email list and they kind of know about you, they just followed you on social media, so they know you at a very superficial kind of level, then you can start to be like, well, here's actually how I got to where I'm at today. People are like, oh, okay. And you start telling that story about all the trials and tribulations that you went through to figure out your triumphs, right? <laughs> and the trophies that you got as a result. Now I'm speaking metaphorically, of course, but you, you talk about the dragons you've slayed and how you've conquered I don't care how little the thing you've conquered may feel to you. Some people are like, I have really bad asthma when I was a kid. Um, does that count? It's like, yes, it counts, right? Tell the story effectively. Like for me, um, I had one time, I, someone was at a live event that I was teaching and I told them, all right, we're gonna do a selling exercise. I want you guys to tell me a story in a persuasive manner, okay? So I looked at one and I said, hey, where'd you get your shoes? Those are cool shoes, where'd you get them? And the story I got back was, um, I went to the mall and uh, I saw them and they were really cool and so I, I got them. And I'm like, eh, no, that's not how we tell stories. What we tell stories is we draw on emotion. We go, I woke up one day and I looked at my shoes and I just felt like disgust. I was like, Man, I've had these shoes forever. They don't even look good anymore. They're worn out. They're not that comfy. I mean, they're past broken in. They're just broke now, okay? So I need to go and get some new shoes. And so I got in the car and on the way to the car, I'm just sitting there thinking like, what kind of shoe am I even gonna wear? Am I gonna get the same thing? Am I gonna look the same? Or do I need to mix it up? Do I need to try something different? And so I walk into the mall and as I'm walking, I'm wasn't, I wasn't even going to this store, but as I was going to a different store, I just happened to look over in the glass case and I saw this shoe and this shoe had this design on it that just immediately 
caught my eye and I was just enthralled by the colors. And I was like, man, I, I need to get closer and check this out. And as I got closer to the designs, actually there was more detail than I imagined. And I was like, okay, okay, this is all cool and all, but if I put it on my foot and it's not comfy, I'm not buying it. So I found the right size and they bring it out to me and I'm excited because I'm just waiting. Like if this shoe fits and it's comfortable, I'm buying this right now. And as soon as I slipped it onto my foot, I knew instantly the cushion was just supporting me just perfectly. And it was like my foot was in a pillow. And, I, and at that point, I screamed at the top of my lungs, sir, please take my money. Okay, so do you see how that story draws on more emotional words, right? Oh, I felt like this and it just, I felt this and I felt this and I felt that and I was feeling this and I saw this and it made me feel this. That type of language is how you tell a compelling story right? Because people can feel that. People are very empathetic. You know, it's a human trait for a reason. If you start to describe how you feel, it's easier for people to feel that on the other side. Like, be honest, in the comments, I want to know how many people that just heard that story were feeling a little bit of like their heart race, a little bit of excitement more than right before I started the story, right? Compared to, I went and did this and I did this and I got shoes. Which of those two stories caused more emotional charge inside of you? I would be willing to bet a decent amount of money that the second story had a little bit more of an emotional reaction within you because I was using emotive language. And so when you use emotive language to describe your story, you're gonna create more of that bond because people are gonna be actually sucked into the story as opposed to just reading it like they're reading an article. You don't want that. That's not fun for anybody, <laughs> unless that's your thing, unless you love reading articles, then it's super fun. Um, but you get the idea. So once they get in the list, you've got to start telling stories. And once you figure out how to become a great storyteller, your content will become easier. Your selling will become easier. The way that you communicate on stage to your fans will become easier. I guarantee this is going to help your music business probably more than any other skill is figuring out how to tell stories effectively that trigger people to want to buy, right? And not because you're like ninjaing the, you know, you're just pulling the craziest stuff. You're just telling stories in a compelling way and you're figuring out that skill set. So that's the third component to this. We still got a few more here or a couple more. The fourth component is financial education, okay? We need to understand that, okay, I need to know how business works if I'm ever going to make my business work. And I got to figure out how money works if I'm ever going to get my money to work for me. Okay. So what we have to figure out is first things first, when you're trying to set up and fund your own music business, you have to set a budget. All right. I know it's no fun to sit around and look at your bank statements and how much money you're spending because sometimes that causes internal anxiety. Like I spent $150 on McDonald's this month. What am I doing with my life? Um, I know I've had those moments, uh, except it was Sonic and Brahms, not McDonald's. <laughs> actually, actually. It was Chick-fil-A. I take it back. It was Chick-fil-A. Um, I, hey, I'm guilty. But what we have to look at is, okay, what is our budget? What can we afford to invest in our music business? And from that level of knowledge, that level of analysis, you can start to figure out the easiest methods forward. For example, when it comes down to like your ad budget, I've had people say, how much do I spend per day? I'm like, well, that depends. What can you afford? Extrapolate this. Do you spend at least $10 a day on fast food. I know nowadays that's, it's like if you wanna go eat fast food, it's bare minimum, cough up $10. So let's say that's the case. That's $10 a day for 30 days on average. So with that being said, that means you're spending $300 a month on fast food. Let's say you take off, you know, it's only one day a week, I, I don't, I eat in. It's like, okay, well you saved yourself a hundred and, what was that? What? Um, $10 times four meals, save yourself 40 bucks. Woo! Um, but if you think about it like that, how many meals can you replace with an ad budget? So for example, $7 a day is a pretty good metric where people can spend $7 a day going to Starbucks to get coffee. Where if you take that where out of your budget, where you're not spending money on that coffee anymore and you replace it with a $7 a day ad budget, you're making the same amount of money. You just replaced something that was not making you money. In fact, every time you bought the Starbucks, it was you were losing money 
and it lasted about five to 10 minutes until the coffee was gone. And then you never get it back ever again. As opposed to over here, you're investing in advertising that is either driving people to your Spotify, which will generate more streams. So over time, you'll start to see accumulation of these streams from all these different people, or which will eventually make you money. Or you could even like drive an ad to get people to join your email list where they go through the sequence and then you sell an offer to help pay for the ad cost and then make profit on top of it. There's all these different things that you could spend your money on. Remember opportunity cost, right? But what do most people do? We spend money on Starbucks. We spend, we spend money on McDonald's. We spend money on Dunkin' Donuts or whatever it is, right? Um, ben and Jerry's at late at night. Um, there's a place called Insomnia Cookies here in the, st in the city that I know late night snacks can become very tempting for a lot of us here. So you have to look at it like this, where how can I take the things I'm spending every month and take those out, be a little bit more frugal, but then I'm gonna replace them with things that are actually going to return an investment on me, right? And not immediately, we can't expect for us to pay for an ad, it, we pay $100 for an ad and the next week we make $100 from Spotify. It's not gonna be that quick, right? But it guarantee you will make money from that because people are now into your world, they're streaming your music more than they otherwise would have and now you're generating revenue. Awesome, right? So it's all about figuring out what do you have right now available to you? Some of y'all are working, you know, some nice jobs, but it's really hard work. So, but you're making a few grand extra every month. Some of y'all are making five, six grand a month, but I know other people, you're working more retail jobs, more fast food jobs and stuff. And so you're making more like two to three grand a month or something, maybe less sometimes if you're living at home. So you have to figure out based on what situation you're in, what is the best move forward? What is the best budget that you could set? so that you can start to afford these things, right? You can afford an ad budget. You can afford to invest in some coaching. You can afford to invest in a book um, or whatever you can get, whatever resources are available to you so that you can get the knowledge you need to get the skills you need to execute in your business, okay? And then the final step, step number five, is networking. A lot of people think the reason I should get set up with like a label or something is because they'll have all the connections. And this business is about who you know. Sorry, that hair was stabbing me in my retina. Um, but people think, oh man, if I just get hooked up with the label, they'll network for me and I'll get all these contacts because it's all about who you know, right? Ha ha ha. People always say that and I'm like, yes, you can have big breakout moments based on people you know. But I think really it's about your music and your marketing. Those two M's matter more than anything. Um, so music and marketing. Is your music good? Is your marketing good? Then I have faith in your music business. <laughs> right? But um, people just think, oh, the net, uh, you know, the, the labels will do the networking for me. But here's a great way that independent artists can start to network in an effective manner. Collaborations. This is so powerful. I want to give you an example. I've talked about them. I talk about them. It feels like, it feels like every video, but they're worth researching. Look at Connor Price and Forrest Frank. Okay? You had these two separate artists building their own niche, but then they saw how like whoa, you have a lot of similarities to my audience. It's like, oh yeah, we do. Our audiences are really similar. Let's do a song together. And then they merge their audiences together. Now the people that knew about Connor but didn't know about Frank are moving over here to check out Frank, and, or Forrest, excuse me. And the people that know about Forrest but don't know about Connor are moving over here to check out Connor. And so these audiences sort of have this merging effect. That is a powerful strategy. So here's what you can do. Identify some of the top people in your niche. Identify some of the top people that are in your specific genre and figure out, okay, I may not be able, so my genre is like the hard rock genre. So I may not be able to tomorrow set up a collaboration with um, Avenged Sevenfold or Shine Down or Disturbed or one of these bands, right? But what if I could set up a collaboration with somebody who's a little bit more in my tier, right? Like a band like, Kingdom Collapse, or Saul, or Black Top Mojo. I say some of those bands because I know the people in those bands, and so we're actually kind of friends. But the whole idea is you can figure out the bands who are sort of a little bit on your level, or maybe slightly above your level. That's really where you want to aim, is the people who are just like one or two steps ahead of you, and then figure out how you can collab with them. Now, sometimes collaborations is making a song together. That's, a, that's probably the most powerful form of collaboration. But another form of collaboration is having a show that you put on together. That's one thing that you can do, but some of y'all don't perform shows, so what's another way that that can work? Another way that collaborations can work is straight up affiliate 
promo, right? So what does that mean? Some of y'all are like, what? Affiliate promo? What I'm talking about is have it to where it's like a tit for tat, you know? Um, I'll support you by showing people, guys, I was listening to this song on the radio from this band, and I just got to say, shout out to them. That sounds awesome. Go check it out. That's such a powerful piece of promo, especially if somebody has a bigger audience than you. And then when your audience grows, what happens when they release something? You go, oh guys, we turned on the radio and our buddies in this band have a new song. Go check that out. That song is killer. Great job, y'all. That is a way that you can start fostering a community of bands that are cool with each other, but you're helping build each other's fan base together. This is the definition of community versus competition. Um, and collaboration versus competition is understanding that other bands are not really your competitors, they're your strategic business partners. And if you can figure out, by the way, don't do this purely to just get you know from people and take from people, please don't do that. Like, if you're gonna engage with people to build a collaborative relationship, sure, we can know objectively that this is going to be good for our business, but the way that you should execute that networking strategy should be like you're just trying to build another friendship, okay? You need to be as chill as possible. If you're always talking about business and all this kind of different stuff, uh, you know, it can come off like the only reason this person talks to me is to take. You know, there was one guy who was talking about a podcast he was doing and the guest he was on mentioned his book like 20 times. And he was so sick of the fact that he mentioned his book 20 times that he went and edited every single uh, you know, mention of the book out of the interview. Uh, so you, you don't wanna be in that sort of mindset when it comes to networking where you just take, take, take. You wanna give, you wanna provide value. For instance, one of the things that I did to help provide value to network with guys like Mark Tremonti, uh, who's the guitar player for Creed and Alter Bridge. And uh, what happened was is I was on tour with Seven Dust, Tremonti, Kane Hill, and Lil Water. We were just big old tour package. and. What happened is, you know, we made a relationship with some of the Tremonti guys, including Mark. And what happened was there was a benefit show that was the day after the last show of the tour. So the last show, uh, show of the tour was in San Antonio at the Epic Event Center. And then, wait, Epic Event Center? No, the, oh, what is it called? I think it's called Epic something. Oh, Vibes, Vibes Event Center. That's what it was called. Epic Event Center is in Wisconsin but Vibes Event Center in San Antonio. And then the next night, there was a benefit show for this gentleman, Seth uh, Fritter, Fitter, but he, um, yeah, he passed away and there was a benefit show that Tremonti was playing, Drowning Pool was playing, um, and they asked us, Tremonti did, do you wanna come play with us tomorrow night at this thing? We said, absolutely. Did we ask for any money? No, we did it totally for free, pro bono, to give value to this benefit show. And I accidentally called Seth Steve on stage because my brain, I was learning Toto and stuff and I, I just got married and I had to learn Toto by, uh, or Africa by Toto. And so I was thinking Steve Lukather and his name was like, no, his name was Seth Luther. And so my brain was mixing Seth Luther and, and, and uh, Steve Lukather. And so, oh my gosh, I went up on stage and I said Steve and then I, then I corrected myself and said Seth, but oh my gosh, it was so embarrassing. But as a result from that, despite that little hiccup on stage, I um, was able to contact and reach people like Donald Carpenter, who was the singer for a band called Submersed back in the day. Um, they sort of released a new album, go check it out. And uh, he was with a band called Blitzkrieg and I Empire. And I was able to reach out and build a contact with him. So Donald then asked us to come play an acoustic show that he was putting on, right? And so now we're in the world of, you know, the Submersed, Tremonti, Alter Bridge, kind of world because we were willing to just go provide value and not ask for any money in return, not be like, hey, if you do this, can you do this for us? Ha 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 No, 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 no. We're just going to provide value and then just be in a good hang while we're there, right? And then from that level, you're actually in a good position because you're not coming from a position to take, you're coming in a position to give, and then people think of you whenever new things pop up because you're one of those people that pops up um, fresh in their mind and you have a good experience with them. So you can do the outreach, Right? But just make sure that you do it from this perspective of giving as opposed to just trying to take from somebody, okay? Now, if you put these five things together, you understand that labels are not gonna do everything for you. There is going to be some responsibility for you to do some things. Not saying you can't delegate, because you can. You know, you could even delegate your ad stuff. 
um, once you get it to a certain point and you don't want to manage it anymore. You can delegate that stuff. But I'm a big believer in Michael Gerber's The E-Myth. You build the system, you know what it looks like done correctly, so then you can hire it out and know when someone's being efficient or not. Then the second step is understand your revenue streams. Understand how you're going to get paid and make money. So you're going to get that through offers and you're going to get that through royalties or residuals, however you want to call that. Um, that can be done, by the way. Streaming can be done through sync licensing too, if that's a path that you're looking to pursue. That's not my specialty. I'd recommend checking out somebody like Greg Savage. He's the DIY musician uh, on the internet. So if you look at him, he's great for sync and that kind of information. Or um, Clint Music uh, is Anthony Clint Jr., I believe is his name. Those are great resources for sync stuff. So how do you get your streaming stuff and you know residuals and all that kind of stuff going? But you figure out those two elements. What are the offers that I'm selling to my fans? And what are the things that I'm doing to generate more streaming revenue, which is more like monthly revenue? And you kind of work those two things in together and that's how you get paid. That's how you fund your own music career is you have fans who are willing to support you because you've told the right stories. So now they can actually take the offers and you've done your budgeting, right? So that you're not you know, spending more money than you're making and all this kind of good stuff. You're setting yourself up in a good position. And then you can start growing by collaborating. There's a great um, salesperson named Chet Holmes who founded this concept called the Dream 100. If you look into that a little bit more into detail, that is a great way of looking at your networking strategy as an independent artist. And so if you combine these things together, I guarantee you're gonna start to actually have the pieces of the puzzle necessary to be able to fund your own music business. So I hope you got a ton of value from this video. If you did, make sure to subscribe, hit the like button, hit the notification bell, all that kind of good stuff. Leave a comment, let me know what your thoughts are on this video. And if you'd like some one-on-one -on -one help to actually set this up in your music business, figure out how to tell some stories better, figure out how to attract your dream fans and sell your offers, then there's a link in the description to apply for a one-on-one -on -one coaching call. So if that's something you're interested in, you can check that out. Otherwise, I will see you on another video inside of Musicians Ignite. Take care.